And if you're able to remain standing for the reading of God's word, uh, let me read from Genesis chapter 17, portions of that chapter. We'll be looking at uh, this in just uh, the next few moments. Genesis chapter 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram, your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan where you are now an alien I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you and I will be their God. Skipping down to verse 15. God also said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Abraham fell face down and laughed and said to himself, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And Abraham said to God, If only Ishmael might live under your blessing. Then God said, Yes, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful and will greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of 12 rulers and I will make him into a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you by this time next year. When he had finished speaking with Abraham, God went up from him. You may be seated. Thank you. Lord, in these moments, I pray that you would help us to hear your voice, that you would truly speak your word to us again, that we might know your will, that we might comprehend your truth, and that your Holy Spirit would guide us as we seek to apply in our lives that which we come to learn. And so, Lord, speak in these moments through me. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, quick Bible quiz. Tell me one thing, or don't tell me out loud, just in your head. One thing you know about the following biblical personalities. Ready? Shealtiel. No? What about Abiud? Zadok? Mathan? I'm getting a lot of blank stares. I would have one as well if I hadn't known this by ahead of time. The answer is every one of those people appears in Jesus' genealogy. In the book of Matthew, we find the descendants of Joseph, the father of Jesus. And Shealtiel, Abiud, Zadok, and Mathan are listed. What about if I had asked you about Josech, Joannanon, Kossum? Don't know them either? It's okay. They're listed in the family tree that's presented in the Gospel of Luke, where Luke details the genealogy of Mary. Were these people that I just mentioned important people? 
We know nothing about them. We don't know what kind of people they were. We don't know what they stood for. We don't know if they were good people or not good people. We don't know what their achievements were. But without them, there would not have been a Joseph. There would not have been a Mary. And I think all of us would agree that Joseph and Mary are pretty important and significant in the whole plan of God. So whether we know who these people are or not, they obviously played a significant role in what God was doing in his plan of redemption for this world. They certainly were important links in a chain. You know, in our world, importance is often measured by achievements, by fame, by accomplishments. This thing is, is that distracting to you? It is to me. See if that helps. The bottom line is that with over 7 billion people on this planet right now, most of them, most of us, will not be written about in the history books. Most of us will be relatively unknown, only to known to a small circle of folks. Not everyone is a mover and a shaker. Not everyone is remembered for doing something crucial and pivotal in the whole history of mankind. Despite Andy Warhol's famous dictum about everyone having 15 minutes of fame, there's a lot of people in this world who will never have 15 minutes of fame or even one minute. Yet much of the important contributions that are made to this world are made by people who never get the headlines, whose names are never in lights, whose names are not in history books. Most of the influential people in our world, let's face it, kind of fly under the radar. And yet each one plays a very significant role. These weeks we've been looking at a phrase, a title actually, that God gives in reference to himself. When God met Moses at the burning bush, he identifies himself to Moses by saying, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And I've made the comment the last couple weeks that one of the things that strikes me is that those three men father, son, and grandson, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, are very, very different people, living very, very different lives, different temperaments. They may have come from the same family, but they certainly were very different from each other. And God says, I am the God of each one of them, of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. Now, Abraham, everybody knows him. The father of nations, the great man. We talked about him last week and his prominence in the Bible, even in the New Testament, where he's mentioned over 70 times. Everybody knows Abraham. And if I had asked you, tell me one thing you know about Abraham, you all could have done that. And probably many more things than just one. And Jacob, Jacob who comes up a little later, well, he's... How do you describe Jacob? I have a word for him. Scoundrel. That's what he was. A manipulator. A trickster. A deceiver. And yet someone whom God used and someone who ultimately came to love God and worship him. We'll talk about Jacob next week. But in the middle, we have this fellow Isaac. What's he famous for? I want you to think about that for a moment. He's a pretty important guy. God says, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We can understand Abraham. He was a great man of faith. We might be able to understand Jacob because, well, he was one who was truly redeemed 
after being not so nice a person. But Isaac, what do we know about him? It seems like all the major events of his life that we have in the scriptures, things are kind of done around him and to him, but he's not actually doing them. You might say, well, I know about Isaac. I remember his birth. We read about that in Genesis chapter 17, the promise of his birth. That's a great story about Isaac. Isaac was born to Abraham and Sarah when they were old. In, in uh, fulfillment of the promise of God. But Isaac himself didn't have a whole lot to do with that, did he? He was just born like we all are born. And then there's his name. How would you like to go through life with the name Laughter? Let's put it this way. I heard a preacher one time say this. How would you like to be named Chuckles? That was Isaac. Yitzhak. It even sounds like a laugh. He didn't choose it. I don't know if he liked it or not. I doubt it. And then the next time we see Isaac, what's going on? Oh, his father's taking him up a mountain to do what? To sacrifice him. God had told Abraham to do that. Isaac went along. Don't know how much he knew about what was going on. Of course, he didn't end up being sacrificed. But once again, Isaac is sort of not the one doing things. He's just sort of there. Things are being done to him and around him. And then it comes time for him to be married. And so what happens? His father Abraham sends one of Abraham's servants to a far place to find a wife for him. He didn't get to pick his own wife. His father's servant did that. And then later on, after he's had two sons, Jacob and Esau, he wants to give his blessing. And he wants to give the blessing to Esau. And so what happens? Jacob, with help from Isaac's wife, Rebekah, tricks Isaac into giving the blessing to Jacob. It seems like the major events recorded in the Bible that include him, he's sort of a pawn. Can you tell me, and don't do it out loud, but could you tell me, One thing in Isaac's life that you remember from the scripture that he was the one who drove the agenda. It doesn't seem to be. I heard once that there are three kinds of people. Those who make things happen, those who watch things happen, and those who say, what happened? I think Isaac seems to be maybe one or both of the latter ones of those. Compare his life to that of his father Abraham and his son. He sort of fades into the background in the narrative. Reminds me the story of Abraham Mendelssohn. Abraham Mendelssohn was a banker. Nothing particularly noteworthy about what he did in his life. But his father was Moses Mendelssohn who is one of the great Jewish philosophers in history and is still revered in the Jewish community as one of the great teachers in their heritage. And Abraham Mendelssohn's son was Felix Mendelssohn, who is a great classical musical composer whose music is still being performed. In fact, some of our hymns are set to his music. Abraham Mendelssohn made the comment, he said, once I was the son of a famous father, now I'm the father of a famous son. I think that's Isaac's life. Son of a famous father, father of maybe an infamous son. Yet God says, I am the God of Abraham, I am the God of Isaac, and I am the God of Jacob. Isaac was a significant person and had a significant role. 
Let's take a look at just what we know about him and what that role might be and what it might say to us today. Significant lessons we can derive from Isaac's life. Here's the first one. God uses people of all temperaments and from all places in life. God uses both type A and type B people. God uses both introverts and extroverts, right-brainers and left-brainers. However it is you like to kind of pigeonhole people, God uses them all. God needs people like Abraham, achievers, aggressive, leaders, out front, prominent, But God also needs Isaacs, those who maybe are in the background, who perhaps are more reserved, more reflective, who aren't out front leading the pack, but a member of the pack. One commentator described Isaac's personality as docile, retiring, and unassertive. I don't know if that's true, but if you happen to be docile, retiring, and unassertive, God can use you. And if you happen to be none of those things, God can use you. The fact is, God uses the Abrahams of the world. He uses the Isaacs of the world. He uses the Jacobs of the world. Court Street Baptist Church is only here because there have been some Abrahams, but there's been an awful lot of Isaacs through the years. A few years ago, our resident historian, Doug Hodgkin, wrote a a wonderful book detailing the history of our church. And I don't know how many names are listed in that book, several hundred probably, at least. But there were far more than several hundred people involved in the 150-year history of Court Street Baptist Church. 10, 20, 30, 40 times more people who contributed in many different ways and yet are largely forgotten in terms of their names. They don't appear on a plaque anywhere in the building. But there were far more of them than there were of those whom the history books record. And Court Street Baptist Church would not be here if it wasn't for all of that multitude of faithful people, all the Isaacs that have been a part of this church. And today our church only functions because of the Isaacs in our church. And I am so incredibly grateful that we have a church full of Isaacs here. There's a comment I just absolutely hate, and that is when I hear somebody say, God can't use me. God can't use me. Let me tell you, if you're still here, God can use you. If you belong to him, God can use you. If you're an Abraham or an Isaac or a Jacob, God can use you. And I'm very appreciative of the Abrahams in my life, but I am also very appreciative of the Isaacs as well. And God seems to be as well because he identifies himself as the God of Isaac. So that's one thing we can learn from Isaac's example. Another is that God uses people who fear him. And for this, I go to a episode in Jacob's life. Later on in Genesis 31, you can read the chapter later on, but in Genesis 31, Jacob is having some dealings with his father-in-law Laban. And this is what Jacob says twice in that chapter as he's swearing an oath to Laban that he will indeed do what he's promising to do. Jacob says, I swear on the God of my father, the God of Abraham, 
and the fear of Isaac. And then later on in the chapter, it says, So Jacob took an oath in the name of the fear of his father Isaac. That's a strange term, isn't it? I swear on the fear of Isaac. Literally, the Hebrew there means the one that Isaac fears. The object of Isaac's fear. Now, when fear is used in the Bible in this time, in this context, we know we're not talking about terror. We're not talking about fright of being afraid. When fear is used as referring to God, it's used in terms of reverence, respect, taking him seriously, and ultimately worship. Jacob says here, as he's swearing an oath, he says, I swear on the God my father fears. I swear on the God that my father reverences and worships. Jacob's frame of reference for God comes from his father's faith, his father's piety, his father's worship. For Jacob, God was really the God of Isaac. The God my dad worships is what he's saying. The God that my dad fears. And he felt so strongly about it and so convinced that it was true that he uses it as part of his oath. Cause me to wonder whether people would ever think of God that way in reference to me or to us. Well, that's the God Dave worships. That's the God they worship and serve at Court Street Baptist Church. Jacob defined God in reference to his father's faith. We often talk about, in Christian circles, about we want to live our lives in such a way that God receives glory. Well, this is an example of it. Isaac lived his life in such a way that God received the glory so that his son understood who God was through what he saw in Isaac's faith. Something about Isaac testified to the God that he loved and served. He was known and identified his rela- uh, by his relationship to God. And the simple question is, are we? Are the people who are closest to us, who know us well, understand us in terms of who we are by our relationship to God through Jesus Christ? God uses people who fear him. And finally, I think we can learn from Isaac that God uses people as links in the spiritual chain, getting back to where I began this message. Here in Genesis 17, God says to Abraham, Your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. God chose Isaac before Isaac was born to be the one who would carry on the covenant, who would carry on the promise. And that promise was simply that God would choose and reserve for himself a people for himself a holy nation of his own. He would be their God, they would be his people. And through that nation, all of the earth would be blessed. And out of that nation would come one who would be the savior of all mankind. Isaac was the second link in that chain. An extremely important chain. 
each of us are links in a chain as well. Physically, in terms of genealogy, but more to the point today, spiritually, we're links in a chain. Think about it this way. God, somewhere along the line, had someone who told you about him and about how to, how to know him. Maybe a whole host of people, but there were people in your lives that communicated to you the awesome truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ somewhere along the line. You wouldn't be here probably this morning if that didn't, that wasn't the case. They were a link in the chain that led to you because somebody had told them and somebody had told them before that and so on and so on and so on. Now, here we are. What happens if the Lord tarries as the generations continue to change, as the world goes forward, and we fade off into existence? Are we a link to what comes after in terms of the family of God? you ever see yourself in that role? It's a very important role, very important function. A link in a chain. Or does somehow the chain stop with you? That would be tragic. be terribly tragic. We're links in a chain, as Isaac was. Heirs to a promise and to pass that promise along. That's our role. We're Isaac. God gave a promise to those who went before us, and they told us about it, and we've responded. And now we're to pass it on. So what do we learn when we look at this fellow Isaac? We see a person that God used, even though he might not have been the bright, shining light that others were. A person God used. We see that he was also a person who feared God, who worshipped God, and that was seen by others. And we also learn that he was a person who was a link in a very incredibly significant chain. God was pleased to call Isaac, call himself Isaac's God. I am the God of Isaac. And you know, there are probably more Isaacs in this world than there are Abrahams. But God is just as pleased with the Isaacs as he is the Abrahams. God considers the contributions that Isaacs make to be just as valid and just as important. So whether you happen to be an Abraham or an Isaac or some combination thereof, please know that you are important to God, that you are important in the work that God is doing in this world, and that you're a very, very important link in a very important chain. That's our task, to be Isaac. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, our God, you made us all different, and you placed us together in this body of Christ. And I want to thank you, Lord, that you can use everyone who is your child, whatever limitations there might be whatever temperaments there might be, whatever gifts and abilities and talents and energies and opportunities that you give. Thank you, Lord, for the reminder this morning that it's not about getting our names in the headlines. It's not about our 15 minutes of fame. It's about being faithful. Faithful to you who called us and saved us 
Help us, Lord, to be faithful in all that we do. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.